Acts 21, 15 through 40 this morning. Winning friends to Christ. There's something that we, we all long to do, isn't it? We all have people we love and, and uh, we want to see know the Lord, those that don't know the Lord. And, and so here, uh, that was Paul's heart for the people of Jerusalem. Uh, Paul loved the Jews. And here in Acts 21, although he knew chains and tribulations were awaiting him when, when he came to Jerusalem, he, he came to, to win the Jews. Uh, Paul's heart and desire for the Jewish people is that they, they would be saved. And, and so he deeply loved them. Uh, Paul was not anti-Semitic <laughs> any more than Jesus was anti-Semitic. And, and although Paul was, uh, had just written the book of Romans, it was hot off the press in this great uh, declaration of the gospel of justification by grace through faith. It was there in, Paul, in Romans that Paul uh, mentioned his deep love for the Jews. And so Paul would leave behind a, a fruitful ministry to go and minister to these people whom he loved. Uh, so maybe you have somebody like that in your life. Uh, maybe you have somebody that you uh, deeply love and you desire to have, uh, that you desire have to, to, to come to faith in, in Christ. Uh, maybe it's a family member or, or friend. Uh, maybe it's an unreached people group or just a group of people that you work with or, or go to school with or live, live next to you. Uh, maybe you're praying for your childhood friends or maybe your old drinking buddies. I don't know. Uh, maybe you desire to win a teammate, a classmate, a mate, or your mate to Jesus. Uh, where, whoever it is that, that you put in that little place of, yeah, I would love to see him, her, them, that group come to know the Lord. This, this message is for you. It's, it's important for us. I certainly have those people in my life that I'm praying for, that I love deeply, that don't know Jesus today. And, and I know you do as well. And so we're going to learn from the Apostle Paul in this portion of Scripture. And, and we're going to glean uh, as he goes to a people that he loves. Uh, these were his countrymen. Uh, these were his fellow Jews. And he loved them deeply. He leaves behind, in fact, a fruitful ministry to go to a very difficult place and to, to desire to, to reach them as well. So if you've not yet opened your Bible, I invite you to do so to Acts 21, 15 through, through, uh, 15 through 40. And because uh, this is such a, an important aspect of our lives as Christians and something we need real wisdom on, let's just pray and ask for the Lord's, the Lord's blessing on it. Father, uh, thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Jesus, you truly are the friend that sticks closer than a brother. And Lord, you loved us and you pursued us as your friends, even when we were running far away from you as quickly as we could. And you pursued us. And, and Lord, we desire to learn from you and we desire to, to learn from this passage of Scripture that we might be able to win our friends. And Lord, we're thankful that you love them more than we do. And so, Lord, teach us and equip us and give us wisdom in this great endeavor. Thank you for laying down your life for us. There's no, there's no greater love than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. And you've done that for us. And now, Lord, would you lead us uh, to do that for others, those that we love and, and those that you love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, a, a friendship can be defined as a bond between two or more individuals who share mutual affection, esteem, intimacy, and trust. Of course, uh, friendship always begins with commonality. We're living in the same place. We're, we're doing the same thing. We have the same kind of hobbies. A friend might be a family member or people you go to school with. Or it could even be just like a, a friendship among a group of people. You find a real bond of everybody from your hometown or maybe even your, your home country. We have, we have these, these friends, people that we do life with. Uh, the deepest friends, friendship moves on from commonality into a deeper intimacy uh, when we uh, go through life together, especially when we bear up each other's hardships and we just never give up on each other. And so that's when it grows into trust and, and more, more intimacy. Uh, but sadly, we've also all known the loss of friendships, haven't we? And, and uh, this message is not about the loss of friendships that, that come 
when there's sin and, and selfishness and, 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 a, and a breakdown of a relationship, uh, uh, that can happen, sadly. We need God's forgiveness, grace, restoration in those times. But, but there are times when, we, when you lose a friend just because you move away or he or she moves away, right? Um, just that distance. Uh, you, you've lost that, that friendship uh, because you no longer have that commonality. Here's another thing that, that can cause uh, the loss of a friendship is just when there's a, a really a, a, a change in common interests. Uh, you're pursuing now different goals and you're, you have different likes and dislikes and, and you can kind of grow apart as friends. And yeah, they were a friend for a time, but you might not consider them a closer friend now. Uh, but uh, the, this message is all about this loss of a friendship. And it's the loss of a friendship that happens when you get saved <laughs> and your friend doesn't. And, and you now love Jesus and now your deepest affection on planet Earth is him. And you have this newfound Lord and, and friend and Savior whom you adore and your friend does not. And there is, there's not a shared love there. There's a complete change in your worldview and your friend is stunted in his or her worldview in the old way. And so it is that we desire to bridge that gap, don't we? We desire to, to win and, and to bring our friends to. We, we desire our friend now meet our, our, our old friend meets our new friend. And that, that, our, that our old friend loves our new friend the way we do. And that we desire that they also be saved. Well, as we consider the Apostle Paul here, uh, we would remind, be reminded that Romans is hot off the press, as I mentioned. The ink is barely dried. And Paul said this in Romans 9, 1 and 2. He said, I tell you, or, or nine, Romans 9, uh, 2 and 3, excuse me. He's, he says, uh, I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Paul's heartache was so deep that these Jews would be saved that he said he'd be willing to surrender his own salvation for the sake of their salvation. And then quite simply put in Romans 10, 1, he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Do you have anybody in that circle today? Somebody that you just would long to know the Lord as you know the Lord. Well, here we come uh, to this portion of Scripture where we, we glean five things about uh, evangelism-styled friendship <laughs> uh, when we desire to win those whom we love. Uh, number one, we have to be willing to go. Uh, number two, it goes along with that, we must be willing to leave. Both of those are kind of reviews of what we've been looking at already. Willing to go, willing to leave. Oh, but here's another one. It's a big one today. Number three, we must be willing to be misunderstood. That's going to happen when you go to share the gospel with somebody. And then fourthly, uh, we need to be willing to do whatever it takes to build bridges and, and, and cross the gap. And, and we need to be willing to do whatever it takes. And then lastly, we'll see here, uh, for, and all of these examples from the Apostle Paul's life, lastly, we, we need to be willing to never give up, uh, just, just to keep on going. And so here we find the Apostle Paul venturing into Jerusalem. Oh, he, he's very much aware that chains and tribulations await him. We pick up in verse 15 of Acts 21, and we consider our, our first point. We have to be willing to go. And so here in verse 15, and after those days, we packed... <laughs> We wouldn't picture Paul stuffing clothes into a carry-on suitcase. Uh, we, uh, we, other translations say we, we prepared for the journey. It was going to be a journey that was going to meet with chains and tribulations. And he, Paul, Paul would probably be arrested. And they kind of knew that. So it's not just they're, they're preparing their goods, but they were preparing their hearts. 
and they packed and they went up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and we brought with them a, a certain nation of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge either on the way there, probably a two-day trip on horseback, or maybe Nason had a spot in Jerusalem. And when we came to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And so uh, here we just see Paul was willing to go. And from verse 15 there, it says they prepared, they, they packed. Paul knew that his venture to win these people whom he loved was going to be tough. Now, hey, I already asked you, do you have anybody in that circle? Somebody that you love that you want to win? You're like, yeah, I got them, right? Put up your hand if you, you had somebody come to mind or a people group, somebody. They're like, yeah, that's somebody I want to win. Uh, now here, how's this? How about right after church you go to them and have a co conversation with them about the gospel? Like, oh, I don't know about that just yet. Because <laughs> it's hard, right? It's challenging to go. Chains and tribulations await you if you do, for sure. They're not going to understand it. I might get pushed back from them. And so here, here are these challenges. We have to be willing to go. And I like it how Paul, although he knew it would be hard, he had to go to those whom he loved. Secondly, we have to be willing to leave. Uh, verse, in verse 18, in, nine, or in verse uh, 17 through 19, it says, And when we had uh, come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Hey, let's picture a room here with Paul and some of the Jerusalem side disciples, people like the brother of Jesus. His name was James on verse, verse 18. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. So these would be Christian Jewish men in Jerusalem meeting with Paul and and some of the others that he brought, Jew and Gentile. In verse 19, when we had greeted them, he told us in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. We'll stop right there at the start of verse, verse 20. And so what we find here is when Paul goes into this room in this meeting, he has an opportunity to tell them in detail. Did you notice that at the end of verse 19? He told them in detail those things which God had done to, among the Gentiles through his ministry. Paul's just ventured on three missionary journeys in Asia and in Europe. Many multitudes of Jews, or I'm sorry, of Gentiles have been saved. Paul gives all the glory to the Lord, and he shares about this in detail. It would take us almost 20 minutes to read from Acts 13 to Acts uh, 20 and that chunk of space. However, uh, Paul lived those over a course of years, and for Paul, telling in detail everything that would happen, they were there for hours. And I believe Paul's just praising the Lord for what he's done. So here's the second point. We're not only willing to go, but willing to leave. Can we just think for a minute that Paul left behind a very fruitful ministry? And it's not like there were closed doors or it had come to an end or people were like, hey, Paul, why don't you go back to Jerusalem already? In fact, they were begging him not to. And so what was it that Paul left behind? And I just, I just know that we have, would have to ask ourselves the question, what is it that, that I should leave behind, set off doing something good for the, for the opportunity of doing something great and winning those people that I love? Oh, we can be so busy in church, in our little Christian bubbles, our little Christian culture, that we fail to take a step out of that little circle, out of that bubble and go back to those friends that are unbelievers and just give an opportunity to, to share with them and, and, and take that opportunity to share with them. So willing to go, willing to leave, but now already on to our third point, we need to be willing to be misunderstood, okay? Now this, is, this goes with the territory when you reach out to people whom you love. And so Paul, we, we can sympathize with him for no sooner does he share all these great stories that there's immediately some pushback picking up there in verse 20. Remember when they heard it, they glorified the Lord they're like, hey, praise the Lord. But they said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews or how many thousands of Jews there are who actually believe. So they're Christian Jews and they are zealous for the law. They're not zealous for Jesus. They're zealous for the law. 
In verse 21, and they've been informed that you teach all the Jews. This is not true. They, that you teach all the Jews who are out there living in all the Gentile countries to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor walk according to the law. What then? Well, we're get, we've got to figure something out here, Paul. Verse 22, what then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. So it's just right here in these verses, we see Paul got a bad rap. Listen to what they were saying about Paul. Paul, you're anti-law. Paul, you're anti-Semitic. You reject the nation and all the laws of Moses. In fact, you go out to all the Gentile countries and you tell them not to circumcise their children. They, they don't have to keep the law. Paul never did anything of the sort. What Paul did do was he preached Jesus. Hey, Paul was not anti-law. Paul was pro-Jesus. And this is exactly what's going to happen to you. When you share Christ, people are going to mishear it. They're going to misunderstand it. I still remember when I was saved and I came out of Detroit, Michigan, and just this party lifestyle with all my old buddies and, and my heart's clean and I'm brand new. And as I began to evangelize them, they misunderstood the message of, hey, Jesus can save your life as uh, they took it more as, hey, I don't even like you guys anymore. And uh, they took my like pro Jesus as like I was now I was anti beer drinking or something. <laughs> And then I don't, I don't get drunk drinking beer anymore. But here's the deal. I wasn't against beer drinking. I wasn't against all of their sinful choices. I wasn't against their lifestyle. I wasn't looking down on them, condemning them. I wasn't anti-sinner. I was pro-Jesus. Even Jesus wasn't anti-sinner. Jesus was pro-Jesus. He, he wasn't against people. He was for people. John 3, 17 tells us succinctly, God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world. Like, how dare you do those things? And why are you like that? And no, God sent his son into the world to save the world. But this is what happens. You come to somebody and you offer Christ as the means of salvation. You come with this worldview. We're all sinners. We're all doomed. I mean, we're all on a bus headed for a cliff. And we have a savior. And he saved me. And, 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 and he saved me from my sin. And now you're my friend or my people group. You're that group where everybody knows my name. And, and I love you guys. And I don't want you heading off that cliff. And I want you to come to Jesus. I want you to be saved the same way he saved me. And we share that. And they just hear, you don't like us anymore. You're condemning us. And so listen you have to be willing to be misunderstood if you're going to share the gospel. Not try to be misunderstood. It's good that we work and make the message as clear as, as we can and share as lovingly as we can. But to be sure, being pro-Jesus will be often misinterpreted as being anti-fill-in-the-blank. In Paul's case, it was anti-law. And so people can come against us I still remember my friend Brian, who's now a Calvary Chapel pastor and has been for 15 years. I have him beat. <laughs> I still remember Brian when he was first saved and we worked together landscaping down at the Bible College. And I just had this passion for him and I just kept feeding him Bible verses and praying for him and encouraging him until one day he just was down in the dumps. And I'm like, Brian, what's the matter? And he looked at me and says, you're the matter. Like off my case, man, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I just realized that, that my affection for Christ was rubbing him wrong. Uh, then the Lord got a hold of his heart not long after but you know what? It rem I remember how much that stung because of how much I loved Brian. And I'm just like, you have me completely misread. All I want for you, bro, is for you to walk closely with Jesus. And, that's, and, and he thought I was just the cosmic killjoy. And, uh, but I was, praise God, the Lord won him. And so it brings us to our next point. 
we have to not only be willing to be misunderstood, but we need to be willing to do whatever it takes. It's easy to burn a bridge. It's more difficult to build one. And we need to do whatever we can to find commonality and, and to, to touch base with people. And so Paul actually goes along with this idea when they said, okay, if you, Paul, now that you're here in Jerusalem, do this. Verse 23 Uh, Therefore, can we give you some advice? We tell you what to do here. Uh, Okay, we have four men who have taken a vow. I mean, these guys have taken a Nazarite vow, and um, they were going to have their hair cut off, and they'd have to pay something at the temple. And So they say, Paul, would you do this? Would you take them and be purified with them? Would you have all your hair cut off because you've been traveling in Gentile lands? And just kind of as a picture that you've been in unclean places, have your hair cut off as well. And then pay their expenses. This was customary for people that had a a Nazarite vow to have others or more wealthy individuals pay their expenses. And Paul had that money from the churches in Rome. uh, Not um, not in Rome, but in... uh, Corinth that he had brought now from Macedonia. So Paul was able to pay their expenses and so that they could shave their heads. And then he says, listen, you do that, Paul, and everybody will know that these things which they've been informed concerning you are nothing. They're going to realize that you also keep the law, but that you yourself also walk orderly, you keep the law. And then, but concerning the Gentiles, James says, remember, we said there's a double standard. Jews and Gentiles, there's still a wall up. Concerning the Gentiles, we've written, this is the Acts 15 council, that they should observe no such thing, except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Interesting, James was even kind of caught up with this hypocrisy where there was still quite a wall built up in Jerusalem. Can't you see it? The Jews were on one side of it. They still kept the law. They were a little closer to God. The Gentiles, oh, they didn't have to do those things. And people were still kind of frustrated. But Paul, desiring to reach the Gentile, Jews, I'm sorry, now, with the gospel, um, is willing to do whatever it takes. He has his hair cut off. He pays their expenses. How does it go? Verse 26. Then they took the men the next day, having been purified with them, and entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification at which time an offering would be made for each one of them. And so they're going through this religious Jewish process, uh, and, and Paul's doing it just to try to build a bridge, okay, uh, to be able to connect with them about Christ. However, verse 27, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, so these are not necessarily the believers from Jerusalem, but the Jews from Asia, or men that had also traveled to Jerusalem during this time for the Feast of Pentecost, um, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help this man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law in this place. This is he. And furthermore, he has brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. That that was not true. These men had not come in. For they had previously seen uh, Trifemus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. They just thought because Paul was hanging out with the Gentile that he must have brought him into the temple. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. So what here, here it's our fourth point. And, and here's our fourth point. You need to be willing to do whatever it takes. So there's two things we'll, we see in this. Paul did attempt to, to build a bridge, didn't he? He had his hair cut off. He paid the, paid the, the uh, offering for these four men. But what happened? It backfired. It miserably failed. He's dragged out and he's, and he's nearly killed. So the first thing we just would realize that it's okay to, to, to build bridges. We want to become all things to all men. And remember 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through, through 22, uh, Paul says, For though I am free from all men, I made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And so to the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. Uh, To those who are under the law, uh, 
as being under the law, not being, uh, and, and then to those who are without law, uh, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak, and I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And so what Paul the Apostle was simply saying is that he would want to, be, he would want to act like a, a Jew when he was around the Jews. It was okay for him to keep the law. He knew that he didn't have to keep the law, but he was free to keep the law. When he was around the Gentiles, he would eat food, eat, eat Gentile food or food sold in the marketplaces because he understood that gods were nothing. But he, whatever he would do, he would try to connect with people, not like a used car salesman uh, who wants to just pick up on some sweatshirt that you're wearing. Oh, that's your favorite sports team. That's my favorite sports team too. And you're like, that's as phony as anything, you know, like go ahead, name three players, you know, and uh, put them to the test. Try it. But Paul was just saying, I want to connect with people. I, I, want, I don't want to be offensive for my own sake. I still remember my, my friend Hayden that was sharing the gospel in evening time uh, at the beach. With, night had fallen. People were kind of moving to their cars, and he found one gal walking s- slowly and and he ran up to her real quick and he said he said if you were to die right now do you know if you'd go to heaven or hell and uh she began to beat him with her purse and and uh and he came away saying i was persecuted for for jesus sake you're like you're not persecuted for jesus sake you're persecuted for your own stupidity's sake man there's better ways of sharing the gospel than that and so We have to realize that when we share the gospel, we do want to connect with people. Uh, When I'm when I'm talking with somebody who is uh, from uh, somebody that is from my past, I'll speak with them differently than somebody that 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 I may meet in in a different arena uh, here in, in Bozeman. And I just, I might just connect with somebody. Who, who is this person that I'm talking to? And I, and I want to try to reach them right where, right where they're at. But listen, right at the end of First Corinthians nine, um, I wanted to highlight it. Nine twenty two, Paul says, "You know, I became all things to all men that I might, by all means, save what? Save some." Hey, listen, you can do your best to build bridges but it's not always going to be received. Remember, Jesus had mixed results when he preached at Nazareth. Some people said he spoke with gracious words. Other people tried to throw him over a cliff. Remember, and, and, and sometimes tactics are just going to be blamed no matter what. When John the Baptist came, they said he had a demon because he ate locusts and wild honey. Uh, but when Jesus came, they said he was uh, he was a glutton and a wine-bibber because he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And so it didn't really matter what way. Some people just don't want to hear. They're always going to find something to blame. But he, he, here's the deal. 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16. We are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, we are an aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? See, as Christians, as we present ourselves, there, our life, trying to build bridges, we will be an aroma of death to some, uh, repulsive to them, but others will be an aroma of life. When I was a kid, I remember when my friends and I had found this turtle, and it, it had just died, and it was, this, uh, it was this large snapping turtle, this beautiful shell, but, but we buried it in the backyard, and when my friends had, had uh, come over about a week later, a few days later, we thought, oh, you got to see this awesome turtle. So we dug it up, and uh, we dug up death. I mean, it was bad, and I remember just like, get that thing back in the hole, and I put my foot on it, and whoosh. so, yeah, you're welcome for that this morning, and... Um, I mean, and then it was just like, we let loose some, some stink at that moment. 
And uh, th those Converse, I, I never got the smell. I had to throw those things away. Like, and uh, like, you know the aroma of death. That was just one, one experience I've had with it. And so there are times when I've, I saw my friends' faces like, oh, what is that? And then, you know, you share the gospel, and that's kind of the same response you get. People are like, oh, come on, man. Like, could you please get away from me? And what it is is they're reminded of their own death. They smell their own perishing flesh on them as the gospel is going forth. But others, it's an aroma of life. And so if we are afraid of extending the gospel because to some we all be an aroma of death, we'll never have the privilege of sharing the gospel with those to whom it will be an aroma of life and they'll, they'll literally be pulled out of, of death and, and come to the Savior. And so Paul was willing to do whatever it, it would take. And then finally, Paul, was, uh, uh, Paul never gave up. And so here's our final point in verses 31 through 40. Uh, you need to be willing to, to never give up. Hey, just one side note just about the gospel. I don't know if that could ever be considered a side note. But do you see the walls the Jews are building up? They cast Paul out of the temple in verse 29, they were so afraid in verse 28 that Greeks had been brought into the temple. Yes, this was still the day. And although some of these were Christian men who proclaimed to believe in Jesus Christ, they still wanted order in the temple. Meaning, they said, Jews can worship God in the temple. Then, but not Jewish women, only Jewish men. Then there's the court of the women, but they can't worship God in the temple. These are believing men in Jesus Christ. And then, oh, and this is the court of the Gentiles. And no Gentile can get near the temple. And then when Paul came, although he did not have a Gentile in the, Christian, in the temple with him, but they just saw a Gentile with Paul in the city, they said, Paul, you must have brought that guy into the temple. So now, Paul, you're not even welcome into the temple area. Paul was excommunicated after the veil had been torn. These men had sewn it up. And listen, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And Jew, Greek, male, female, rich, poor, slave, free, all welcomed right into the Holy of Holies. And that's where we find our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, right there. And he is our friend, Christian. And listen, we need to welcome people into that place. And so Paul was willing to go, willing to leave, willing to be misunderstood. Uh, he was willing to do whatever it took, and, and he was also willing to never give up. Let's listen to what they do to the Apostle Paul here in verse 30. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple. Immediately the doors were shut. Then, now verse 31, now as they were seeking to kill him, and that means not that they were like wondering what could we do to kill him, they were killing him. They were actually beating him. Like they're seeking to kill him while actively torturing him, beating him, maybe stoning him. Um, as they're seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison uh, that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. So now a bunch of Roman soldiers say like, hey, the peacekeepers like, hey, the Jews are fighting again. We better go do something. And so then verse 32 and so he immediately took the soldiers, or this is the, the leader of this group of soldiers, and he ran down to them. And when they, the Jews that are beating Paul, saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So that's how we know they were actually physically trying to kill him. And they stopped beating him. Then the commander came near and took him. And the commander, uh, and, he, and commanded him to be bound with two chains, and he asked what he had done. Like, what, what did you do to tick those guys off that they're trying to kill you? And verse 34, and then some of the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the, the truth because of the tumult, he commanded Paul to be taken into the barracks and now come into the Antonio Fortress. And so you can imagine Paul, he's, you know, his, his plans backfired and he's now being brought in and carried at verse 35, it becomes very descriptive. And when the, he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, away with him. And then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, 
may I speak to you? And he replied, well, can you speak Greek? Let's just pause here for a second. Paul's plan backfires. They're physically trying to kill him. Uh, the, the, the mob is so violent that Paul actually has to be carried. He's about to be brought in. And Paul's like, wait, 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 just a minute. And the guy's like, what? And if you were in that place, you'd be like, get me out of here. Get me into the safety of the Antonio Fortress. But Paul said, I'm not done with these guys yet. And he said, can I speak with them? And this was Paul's heart. Verse 38 the, the Roman soldier has no idea who Paul is, no clue. He says, are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? Paul says, no, I'm not that guy. Uh, <laughs> I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no small city, no mean city. And I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. I just want to talk to him for a minute. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and he motioned with his hand. And the people were like, he's going to talk. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language. And then they become even the more silent. And we'll have to wait two weeks, one week after Easter, to hear what Paul says here. Sorry. We'll consider it. It's the power of a personal testimony. And that's what Paul's going to say. And it takes up most of chapter 22. And Paul's going to share his heart with them. But I just want to say this. Paul didn't give up. Like he wanted to share and he wasn't done with them. And you know what this reminds me of? This whole scene? Yeah, you got it. Jesus. These men had stirred the rest of the multitude against Paul. Just like after on Palm Sunday. Day we celebrate they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In the latter part of the week, the religious leaders stirred up the crowd and they said, crucify him, crucify him. Just as they, they said here in verse 36, away with him, away with him. And so it was that Paul says, I'm just not done. And here we're reminded uh, that Jesus came to his own and he was greatly misunderstood. And his own did not receive him. And we also are mindful that on the cross uh, that Jesus died for our sin. And hey, John 15, 13. There's no greater love than this than for a man to lay down his love for his friends. Jesus truly is the friend who sticks closer than a brother. He's the one that has beckoned us into a relationship with him, even when we were running far away, even when he was misunderstood. Jesus was willing to go. He was willing to leave the glories of his Father in heaven. He was willing to come to earth. He was willing to be misunderstood. He was willing to do whatever it took to save us. And he did so by dying on the cross and rising triumphantly from the grave. And he's willing to never, ever give up. In fact, he's still pursuing us today, is he not? He's never giving up on us. And he loves us, and he's so faithful. And I still remember my friend Ken, one of my greatest life lessons in ministry. My friend Ken, who led the homeless ministry to heroin addicts in the park in Lake Elsinore, California, where every Sunday and every Wednesday after church, we'd go and serve these people. And the city really tried to crack down on it and pushed us out one way or another until one time they forcibly showed up and said, you're not allowed to be here. And if you show up here, they'll be fine or, or, or uh, some, some sort of jail or something. And, and I remember at that point leaving and I thought, oh, I have my Sundays and Wednesdays back. And Ken looked at me and says, no way. He says, I'm going to go there next week and have lunch with my friends. I'm going to have a picnic with my friends. And if they want to arrest me for having a picnic with my friends, they can. He said, but those people, will not, those people will know that we love them if we never give up on them. And we showed up the next week, and that ministry continues to this day. And, and many of them came to faith in Christ. And you know what? We know the Lord loves us because he's never given up on us. And your friends will know that you love them. If you never give up on them, and I know you want them to love Jesus just the same way you do. 
And so don't give up on that hope. Continue to present him to, to them and let him love, let him win them in his time and in his way. And Jesus is certainly the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Father, thank you uh, for your word this morning and, and do pray that you would win those whom we love deeply. Hey, some of them might even be here. We invited them this morning. And Lord, I pray for any in this room that don't know you as a friend, uh, that, have, that uh, don't have an affection for you. Lord, remind them of how good you are. And right now, I just would tell you that, that Jesus loved you and he died for you and he rose again to give you life. He's beckoning your heart and he's drawing you to himself and would just open your heart and receive from him today. And Lord, for all of us, would you fill us afresh with your spirit as we go forth and we share you with others. Uh, Lord, in Jesus' name, uh, would you gift us uh, to make us willing to go, uh, willing to leave whatever we need to leave behind to do it, uh, willing to do whatever it takes. Uh, Lord, willing to be misunderstood, uh, willing to never give up, Lord. Uh, because that's what you've done for us. And we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.